Hello, my name is Joyce Raimondo. I'm the Education Coordinator at the Polly Krasna House and Study Center, a national landmark in East Hampton, New York. We're located about 100 miles east of New York City. To learn more about the landmark and how you can visit in person, visit pkhouse.org. You can also go to our events page to see the many um, virtual programs we have available to the public for free. Today's program is called Art Lovers. We're going to take a look at love through the eyes of artists and primarily romantic love and different uh, facets of love as well as different ways to approach the subject visually. So let's get started. I'm going to share my screen. So uh, let's start with Lee Krasner and Jackson Pollock, who are called abstract expressionists. That is, they are expressing their feelings, their energy, their emotions, their inner selves through abstract art. Um, Lee and Pollock met in New York City, and they were both uh, upcoming artists, and um, they moved in with each other. They met each other uh, first at a dance, but uh, Lee didn't really remember Pollock that well from that dance, so she usually tells the story that they actually met through an exhibit that they were in at Macmillan Gallery, she saw Jackson Pollock's name on the card on the listing of artists who were in this group exhibition. And she wondered, who is Jackson Pollock? She boldly went to his studio, his uh, apartment in New York City, introduced herself, and the rest was history. Lee uh, managed Pollock's career. She was very, very good at negotiating on his behalf with Peggy Guggenheim. She secured a stipend for Jackson Pollock to paint in the barn studio, which is now a national landmark in East Hampton. And um, she also arranged for a loan from Peggy Guggenheim for a down payment on the house in the Springs, East Hampton. So this couple moved from uh, New York City to East Hampton in 1945, bought the property in 1946, and many, many artists followed Pollock and Krasner to the east end of Long Island, where this became really um, a very important location for artists um, in the United States. And this type of art called abstract expressionism, um, this groundbreaking art sprung up in the Hamptons as well as New York City. So here is our couple. They got married after they moved to the Springs. They had two dogs, Gypsy and Ahab. They did not have children. So here is a painting that Jackson Pollock made called Male and Female. This shows the period when Pollock starts to move away from painting the world as we see it, the observed world, and we see that he is painting his inner world. He's inspired by indigenous people's art, by Picasso's art, and he has all sorts of signs and symbols, shapes, um, colors, um, mark making um, in the painting. And if you look closely, you'll notice there is, are, is actually two, are actually two figures um, embedded into all of these designs. So on the left, we see a female figure. In the red, we see what appears to be a breast and eyes with eyelashes. On the right, we see a long rectangle, which could be read as a male with all sorts of mathematical um, notations. And in a sense, in my opinion, this is sort of a stereotypical view of male and female, right? The Male is um, black, pictured with black, a rectangle, more rational, mathematical, analytical. The female is more sensual. Red usually stands for passion, for feeling, and so on. And um, Lee and Pollock actually did have what would be considered a traditional relationship in the sense that Lee did not promote her career and her profession while she was married to Pollock. 
She always painted, um, but she put her own career on the back burner to focus on Pollock as the sole breadwinner while they were married. And she was very good at it. And Pollock rose to fame during um, his lifetime. And he also was making a significant amount of money and he was financially successful. Um, Lee would also host gatherings of artists and critics and things like that in the house, um, cooking and uh, entertaining to also promote Pollock as an artist as well. Sadly, Jackson Pollock succumbed to alcoholism and um, he died in a car crash in 1953, drink, uh, 1956 rather. He was 44 years old, he was drinking and driving and um, he took the life of Edith Metzger, a passenger with him and his mistress, Ruth Kligman was in the car, she survived. Now there was a period where Pollock was sober for two years and that's when he made his great drip paintings. So the alcoholism destroyed his life, destroyed his creativity and destroyed his marriage. And Lee says, Jackson always treated me as an artist. He always acknowledged, was aware of what I was doing. I was a painter before I knew him and he knew that. And when we were together, I couldn't have stayed with him one day if he didn't treat me as a painter. So Lee always painted, but it was only until after Pollock's death that she resumed um, promoting herself professionally as an artist in galleries and things of that nature. And here, of course, Pollock is shown doing his famous drip painting technique, dripping paint from sticks to create 100% abstract art. This is called abstract expressionism. He's expressing his energy and his feelings, getting his feelings out, getting his energy out in a very physical way through paint. That's not to say he's flinging paint in a frenzy. He was actually careful and methodical. Lee was also an action paint, um, an abstract expressionist. This style of art is called action painting also. You can see Lee's movement in this painting. This is a large mural size painting. You can imagine her swirling and making these sweeping marks as she moves from one side of the canvas to the other. She doesn't have any idea in mind when she's painting in advance. She lets the painting come through. She surrenders. She says, I don't will the painting. And her inner life comes through. This is one of the first paintings she made after Pollock's death. You can imagine how devastating that was for her. She was in Paris. She gets the news, comes back, and resumes her um, activity as an artist in the barn studio where Pollock had formerly been painting, uh, had previously been painting. So I want you to look at the painting and think about what do you see in this painting? What feelings might you associate with this painting? There's no right or wrong answers when you look at modern art. Often modern art is ambiguous. The meaning is not clear cut. The artist, him, her, or their self don't even really know exactly why they're painting the images. It flows forth in a very natural way. It's an improvisational way of painting. When I look at this painting, and this is my personal interpretation, I see grief. I also see life and joy. I see with the curves and the colors of the red and the green and the imagery of seeds and hearts and um, leaves and fruit, things like that. I see a life force coming through. I also see the weight of grief with the heavy black lines that are dripping down. And sometimes I can even see that um, shape towards the right as an upside down heart, or it could be a woman, okay? But you can see it in your own way. Now, what makes this abstract expressionism is the very physicality of the paint. We see the dripping, we see the brushing, we see the artist mark, we see Lee's energy. It's like a dance of paint. And eventually Lee's uh, paintings give way to these vibrant colors that are filled with, uh, nat uh, with beauty, uh, with passion, I could say. 
and also uh, sometimes with images of nature. She stays in, she lives in the um, house and works in the barn till the end of her life in 1984. And at that point, she also had an apartment in Manhattan and she arranges before her death that the site would become a museum under the auspices of Stony Brook University. This type of painting is also called all over painting. You have a pattern throughout and it goes right off the edge, right? Um, there's no central figure. This is all over painting. Let's take a look at intimate portraits by modern artists. This is Pablo Picasso, the dream. Pablo Picasso is painting his lover, but he's not painting a likeness of the woman. We wouldn't recognize this person if we saw her walking down the street, would we? He's painting his feelings towards the woman as well as her own feelings. And art becomes very subjective. Now, take a look at the woman. What impression do you get? What feelings might this make you think of? And again, there's no right or wrong answers. Most people, when they see the painting, they think it looks relaxing, calm, sensual. But what makes it look that way? The color, the tones of her skin and the colors of her clothing are very uh, close to each other. There's not a lot of contrast. So that gives a very calm feeling. The lines themselves are very sensual and curvy, right? So that also gives a calm feeling. But how does he show the passion and the desire that he has for this woman? He puts her sit seated in a red chair and her lips are very, very red, right? Red usually is a color of fire, of passion, of intense feeling, right? Even you could say of desire. And then her face itself, it's a, done in a style of cubism where you could see a profile on her nose, but then you can also see as if it's turning and facing forward, you see her eyes and her lips are frontal. This is cubism, more than one viewpoint. But what's interesting is if you look really closely, it almost looks as if half of her face is the shape of a penis. Now for many, many years, men have painted the beauty of women, the woman as a muse, the beauty of the female body and the female nude. Eunice Golden is an artist who's considered a feminist artist. And she begins painting in the 1970s her desire for the male, for the male nude. And she paints her partner in sometimes in these very, very um, almost candy-like, very sweet colors to indicate her desire, right? This is very, very radical. In the history of art or lining museum walls, you will find very few, sometimes none, no paintings of a woman's viewpoint of their sexuality and their desire for the male. This is an earlier um, portrait of Alice Neal with her lover, her boyfriend, her partner, Jose. Also very, very intimate and very radical for its time. Um, now, what do you notice about this portrait this uh, photographic portrait of Robert Mapplethorpe. It's called The Embrace. Now, what is in that, for that era in 1982, at a time when homosexuality was still, a lot of people were closeted. It wasn't as accepted as it is today, right? And not too long before that, homosexuality was illegal in the United States. Um, and this portrait is showing the, a loving embrace, an intimate loving embrace between two men and also two people of different races. But what's so beautiful about this embrace is if you didn't even see it as two bodies, if you just see the composition of the arms and the curves of the arms and how they go throughout, 
and connect and are intertwined, it's a beautiful expression of intimacy, isn't it? Also, 1982 and the 1980s was the age, um, the era, unfortunately, of AIDS, where many, many young people were dying of AIDS, especially within the homosexual gay community. And it was largely ignored um, in terms of medical research and resources because it was seen as a gay disease. And uh, many artists address this in their work, such as Robert Mapplethorpe, as well as Keith Haring, and many other artists of that time. So the overall question would be, through whose eyes do we define our sexuality, right? How do we define our, the way we relate to intimacy, the way we relate to um, romantic love? And of course, it's primarily through the media, right? as well as our culture and our, our families, but the media images are so powerful, movies, right? Um, advertisements. It forms the idea of who we are and how we relate to um, love. And sometimes it's a contrived idea, right? Like Marilyn Monroe, diamonds are a girl's best friend. It promotes the diamond industry. It promotes the idea that if a man loves a woman, he is going to buy her an expensive diamond ring for an engagement, right? It promotes ideas about how we look in order to be desirable, right? So in Marilyn Monroe's day in the 1950s, the look in this country, right, was to be curvy, to be blonde, and to be white. Now, of course, this has changed and we're much more accepting of different body types, thankfully, different um, sexual orientations, um, and also different ways of expressing our gender. And um, we have more representation in movies and the media of different races and ethnic groups as well, which is a celebration in my opinion. Now, all of these images are created by men. So when women are watching these movies, we're actually seeing ourselves through the eyes of men. We're seeing actually what a man defines as beauty, what a man defines as desirable and sexy. And that's why an image like this by Eunice Golden is so important. We get to see an expression of sexuality through a woman's eyes. So let's have some fun looking at how artists portray the kiss. Of course, the most famous kiss probably in art, one of them is by Rodin, 1882. But this is a very good um, example of, a, it's a contrast in different approaches to representation. So on the left, we have two lovers embracing in a kiss and it's idealized, right? The figures are, their bodies are, would be considered, you know, at, the man is very athletic. The woman is very sensual, right? They're not flawed at all. Um, and they're in this loving, passionate embrace. And it's, it's somewhat realistic, but in an idealized way. On the right, we have the kiss by Brancusi. So what happens in a piece of artwork like this? How is it different than the artwork on the left? You'll notice the form is simplified, right? The two figures come together as one with the lips and the eyes. Their loving embrace, their kiss, the arms, they it it's wraps around, it's, it's, they're completely connected. But all the details have been pared away. Brancusi is showing us the essence of what it means to have a loving kiss, right? He's showing us the feeling right? He's not showing us two people that we would recognize or know or any details. He's eliminating details to get at the main idea, two separate people joining as one. This is a major theme in modern art, the idea of eliminating unessential details to express the essence of the idea, right? Of course, here's the famous kiss by Gustav Klimt. So what do we see here? We see an embrace and a kiss, and the faces are realistic, right? 
but then they're covered in gold with these very luminous, beautiful patterns. And I think it's interesting, like Jackson Pollock's painting, on the left, we see these black rectangles. On the right, we see circles in red and more decorative kind of designs in the woman's uh, dress. And then we also have these beautiful gold leaf patterns. You see all those circles and spirals. He would take the gesso um, while it was still wet and he would scrape patterns into it. It would harden and then he would gold leaf over it. So if you saw the actual painting, you would see some of it is raised and slightly three-dimensional in relief. But what's so intriguing about this painting to me is the different ways you can interpret it. How do you feel when you look at this picture, not how do you feel, but how do you interpret this embrace and this kiss? Is this a loving kiss? Is this a tender kiss? Is this surrender? Is the woman surrendering or is she submissive? Is she being dominated or is this intensely pleasurable? Is this intimate or is this controlling? And it really isn't clear cut. Here's Rene Magritte, The Lovers. This is a surrealist painting. And this is really psychologically charged. Surrealism um, is, the term means more real. And so more real than what? More real than just simply seeing the way a person looks or going about our day in a rational way. Surrealism, what's more real is our inner life. And Re Rene Magritte, creates these paintings where he'll change maybe one or two elements to create a mystery. So here he has the embrace and the kiss, but he covers up their faces. And I'm going to invite you to wonder, what is the meaning behind this? I've heard some very surprising responses. Some people look at it as a positive. They love each other. They don't care what they look like, right? Other people see it in a more negative light. There is no intimacy between them. They're kissing, but they don't know each other, okay? So I invite you to wonder and let your mind wander and think about what you perceive when you see an image like this, okay? When you look at modern art, as I said, it invites the viewer to complete the painting, right? It invites the viewer to, to come up with your own interpretation and your own perceptions. It's a mystery. So Roy Lichtenstein is a pop artist. Pop is short for popular. And what he does is often he derives his imagery from advertisements. This is 1961. We're inundated with ads, with movies, with images that tell people this is what love is. This is what an ideal person looks like. This is what an ideal relationship looks like, right? So on the right is an advertisement. The image on the left was not taken from this specific advertisement, but you can see how he is playing off of this idea of a contrived idea of what love is, right? And if you look at uh, the painting, at first it might look kind of simplistic. Okay, well, there's a pilot and he's kissing this blonde woman. But then when you look at it closely, you'll see there's a lot of ambiguity and strange things going on in here. For example, look at his hand. The hand, it's like he's got a firm grip on her, on her hair, right? And... Um, you know, the more you look at it, the more you realize that even visually, it's very, very complex as an abstract work of art. And this again calls attention to the contrived aspects of love in our culture, right? The diamond ring as an engagement ring. But then you see all those jagged shapes, those red jagged shapes, and I wonder, uh, what does that mean? Is it some kind of anxiety? Is it some kind of trap? Is it like a fence that you get caught into, right? 
And some of this is my own interpretation. It's what I think when I see this picture. So let's talk about some love stories here. Real life love stories, Frida Kahlo and Diego Rivera. And this is a, a wedding portrait by Frida Kahlo, the famous Mexican artist. Frida Kahlo painted all the stories of her life. And um, Frida Kahlo had a serious bus accident when she was an older teenager, which um, she kept her bedridden for many, many months throughout her life and many surgeries. She had over 40 surgeries. It was really very painful for her. Um, following that bus accident, in bed, her mother sets her up with paints and she begins to paint self-portraits. She meets Diego Rivera. He's a very famous Mexican muralist. She boldly approaches him as he's working on a mural and says, will you look at my art? The couple falls in love and they get married. Her parents, especially her mother, was against the marriage. He was much older than her. And um, her father thought, well, according to what I've read, she has a lot of medical expenses and he is very wealthy, successful artist. He can take care of my daughter. But anyway, they get married and this is her marital portrait. And you could see she's in um, traditional Mexican clothing, which she celebrated her Mexican heritage. He's shown with a palette in his hand as an artist. I'm wondering how, how do you interpret this? How is she showing us herself in this couple? It's She's eliminated her, her, her palette. She's not showing herself as an artist. She's showing herself as very, very small next to him which she was in real life, but she's also exaggerating it. For example, look at the feet. Often size in a painting is symbolic of power, right? Like in Egyptian art, slaves are shown as very, very small next to the Pharaoh, right? So here she shows herself tiny, tiny, and she has her head tilted to the side in a very feminine pose, right? And we wonder what is the power structure of their relationship? Now they had a tumultuous relationship. It was very passionate. Uh, Diego Rivera was a womanizer and Frida Kahlo knew that going into the relationship. Eventually, and she also had love affairs herself with both men and women while they were married. Eventually Diego Rivera cheats on her with her sister, Christine, and they get divorced. But then they actually wind up getting remarried but the second time around, they agree that they will have a celibate marriage and live side by side in two separate buildings that would join by a bridge. And here is her portrait, Diego on my mind. So you can see in this portrait, it's almost like she's obsessed with Diego Rivera. He's stamped on her head or in her head, like a tattoo or like he's in her mind. And, um, Frida Kahlo often tells the story of her life and her relationship in a way where she's telling a true story, but she's imbuing it with aspects of imagination. And here she is in traditional Mexican clothing. The love embrace of the universe, the earth, Mexico, myself, Diego, and Senor Exult. I'm sorry, I didn't pronounce that correctly. Um, Frida Kahlo said that she, it's interesting, Diego Rivera was this powerful man, this powerful muralist, right? One of the most important artists in the world. And yet uh, Frida Kahlo kind of thought of him as someone who needed to be taken care of, like a child. And she's showing this embrace in this painting, but then she's also embraced as well as he is by what peer, appears to be Mother Earth. And then when you go further back into the distance, there's another figure in the sky, right? Embracing both of them as well. Um, so this picture shows many, many double images here. So the breast, for example, looks like a breast in the mother earth figure, but you could also see it's like a river and the water is dripping out of the nipple. The face, looks like a face in the white, but then it also becomes clouds. 
This is a technique you'll see a lot in modern art where an image is actually a double or even a triple image where it can be read in more than one way. Um, now, sometimes, as we all know, things don't go well in relationship. There's all sorts of anxiety. This is by Asuka uh, Kokoschka, and it shows a couple, and they don't seem to be communicating. She's looking away, right? She's looking not at him. He's not looking at her either. Look at the hands. Look at the background. What would you say is the overall feeling in this picture? When I look at this, I see anxiety, right? The hands are not touching. She seems to be covering herself, protecting herself. Some people almost see it like she's holding a child. And her, his hands look almost bloody red. And it's almost like they're quivering. The hands seem to be quivering and shaking. And they're trying to touch each other, but they're not touching each other. They're not meeting. The fingers are not meeting, right? And then the figures seem to blend into the background and all the mark make, making aspects of the painting, it's fraught with anxiety. There's scraping, swooshing, shaky lines. This gives it a feeling of fear. And then the faces themselves look very white and pale and ghostly, right? Here is Henri Matisse, the conversation, the divorce, right? What's going on here? We have two figures facing each other, but they're separate. It looks as if she maybe is receiving news from him and she's taken aback, or maybe he's receiving news from her. But clearly it's not a loving picture like the ones that we saw of the kiss or the embrace. We're gonna end with Marc Chagall. I think Marc Chagall is the best known artist for his loving portraits of his wife, Bella, who he was in love with and they had a beautiful marriage. And you see the story of their love affair in many of his paintings, where he shows not only her beauty, but it's as if the couple is floating. And we say when we're in love, it's like we're floating on, in, on cloud nine, we'll say in English, right? So this one is called the birthday. We also see the colors, the red, right? It expresses passion and love. The room looks very warm, right? And we can imagine maybe she just received flowers and there seems to be some food on the table. Um, on the, these are two beautiful wedding um, pictures, right? And uh, Marc Chagall's paintings, they have a fairy tale magical quality to them, right? We see figures floating. We see the canopy in the background on the painting on the left, the huppa um, where the couple um, most likely was married. Mark Chagall was Jewish from Russia. And we see um, musical instruments and cows dancing and flying and flowers floating in the sky and the one on the right. And we also many times in Chagall's painting see a very warm yellow color, a sun, um, sometimes against a blue calm um, color. So sometimes Mark Chagall's paintings suggest a cycle of day and night, of activity and spirit, of rest and activity, right? Or just cycle of time, right? And moving through space. So I hope that you enjoyed our talk. I'm giving this talk on February 1st, 2024, and Valentine's Day is approaching. And I hope that uh, you enjoy your upcoming holiday and enjoy the talk. And now I invite you to create a painting or a drawing about love. It doesn't have to be romantic love. Love comes in many forms. It could be love of a child, love of a pet, love a family, a spouse, right? A friend, a parent. We celebrate love on Valentine's Day. So think about what approach you want to use. Do you want to tell a story? Or like Pollock and Krasna, do you want to make abstract art to show your feelings? Okay, so thank you very much.